Brian Cox has graced both stage and screen for decades, but is perhaps best known for playing TV's most tyrannical media mogul, Succession's Logan Roy. I know that you've read a lot of books about business management and this and that, but you know what? What? Sometimes it is a big dick competition. The media dynasty at the centre of this HBO hit drama has drawn numerous real-life comparisons, from the Murdochs and the Maxwells to the Redstones and the Trumps. In The Economist Asks podcast, Cox reveals his own understanding of the flawed character he's so famous for and why the show struck such a chord in America's current climate of cultural division and political polarisation. Brian Cox, welcome to The Economist Asks. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Nice to see you again after all these years. Yes, we should perhaps let our audience in, in on that little, little secret. I came on a tour with the National Theatre oh, just after the fall of the Berlin Wall in Eastern Europe, and you, you were playing uh, yeah. King Lear, and some might say in succession you kind of still are. There's elements. I mean, it's uh, you have to accept that there's something kind of universal and archetypal about the characters, and particularly Logan. He's a, he's a kind of archetype, and uh, Lear, of course, is an archetype, so they, they, they do cross over considerably. You're publishing a memoir, putting the rabbit in the hat, and, and there you write, you love playing Logan Roy, but what sets him apart from other stage and screen villains you've played in, in, in the past, whether it's Hannibal Lecter in Man, Manhunter, Helen Goering in Nuremberg? Uh, obviously, some people look at you and think, you know, we can cast him as the big bad guy. It's always a privilege to to get the role. Um, I, I think that the the real concern or the real job is to understand the humanity of people, to understand where they come from. You know, you know, if you look at a baby or you look at a, an infant, they 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 don't come into the world bad. They develop it or they develop good. Those things are conditions, and conditioning counts for everything. And Logan, I think there's a tragic element to Logan because he's, he clearly has had some kind of trauma in his life. We don't quite know what it is, mm. and we all may never know what it is, and the result is who he's become now. But from the actor's point of view, you have to really understand the life and the conditions that have made you and the decisions that you've come to, to stop talking, to be monosyllabic, because he's quite monosyllabic, and he is... He is a mis- he's a misanthrope, you know. He and I, you know, we have a lot of things in common. In the fact that we are both both deeply disappointed with the human experiment, uh, especially at the moment, it doesn't look very good uh, with the crises we have around us. And so, somebody like Logan is a man who is ruthless, uh, seemingly uncaring, uh, but he actually the one thing that's in a way, anyway, his is 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 his Achilles heel, but also something that that kind of partly reclaims him is his love for his children. He does love his children, and he, he finds it impossible to express that love because, in fact, that love has never been expressed to him. Everybody loves speculating who it's, in inverted commas, really about, which probably drives you crazy. And, and the leading candidates being, of course, the Rupert Murdoch's family, but also some of the Redstone, that uh, huge kind of venture capitalist family, even the Trumps uh, as well. When you're looking at a particular scene and how you're going to address it, do you think, hmm, I've seen this or I've read this and I'm going to channel it into this family in the Roys? You know, I mean... The roots of the Redstone family, Murdoch, even the horrible pink Pinocchio, Trump, you know, there are roots there. You know, you can look at Trump and you can see this clearly was a child who had to survive this awful father. But then you look at his father and think, what was his conditions? You see, we're all subject to conditions and uh, Murdoch's the same. And that's what's interesting. Succession struck a particular uh, chord when it launched because it was Trumpy red zeitgeist, the dysfunctional family, the sibling rivalry, the uh, leader, both uh, dominant uh, and also often quite random in his judgments. And of course, that focus on the role of the media in politics. Do you think Succession would have felt so timely if it weren't for the Trump presidency? 
the, the irony of ironies was the fact that we did our first episode when the day Trump was elected. We had the first read through of the, the, sh the show when Trump was elected and everybody was going off to see Hillary win. I was, I had, as Miss was we say in Scotland, I hear me doots, I hear me doots about that, you know, that she was going to win. And there is an argument that she lost it as much as he won it. You know, that that's a debate too, the one to have. And, uh, the Trump presidency, as anybody and I have, I lived in through it all, is, was appalling. And it was just the hardest time to be alive in America. And so much of the value of America, he destroyed, you know. And I wonder to what extent someone said to me, look, this show, you can read it as a bit of a sort of liberal pinata beating up on the wealthy and particularly that right, right wing, right leaning uh, family media business. Do you think that the lessons apply as much to liberal left liberal dynasties as they, they do to conservative ones? I mean, could it be also to an extent about the Bidens? I think it possibly could. I, I think there's a there's, you know, there's a sort of wooliness about the Bidens, which is hard to kind of. You know, but he's also part of that whole that whole system, that American political system, and he can't escape that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I think that's a fair enough point. I mean, and clearly, you know, it, I mean, clearly, Jesse has a kind of strong socialist view. I mean, it's it's very Swiftian. It's very it, the whole thing has a kind of satirical element to it. Yes. You know, because the, the the use of comedy, the use of the the humor in it, it, it gives it that sense of uh, you know, detachment that where you can look at it detachedly and not become like in many dramas where you're kind of swept away. But the irony is the show has swept people away because they're seeing people that they love to hate. And that's, that's again, the human condition. We, as humans, we love to look at people that we love to hate. And there's no getting around that. That's just who we are. When you look around Hollywood, you see so many uh, dynastic uh, setups of uh, of families and the extent to which, you know, if you're already living in and in, in around uh, the world of of film and of television, you have a flying star. In Britain, we've had a uh, private school system, as we'd say in America, public schools, we'd call it. In, in Britain, have produced really big stars, well, Eddie Redmayne, Benedict Cumberbatch, to name just a couple. Uh, it does make one wonder whether the, the rise of the, the wealthy and, and the posh has really had as much impact on theatre, television, film as it has well, think, on the rest I of life. I think it clearly has. Yeah. I think it clearly has. You know, there's no, I mean, somebody like me coming from where I came from and the social mobility I experienced when I came to London, I mean, London, coming from Dundee, because it, we didn't know what was going on. And so when I came to London as a young uh, actor uh, or a young uh, acting student, I mean, I, I had a grant. I had living expenses. I had uh, uh, expenses for my scholastic expenses. It was phenomenal. And I was given, and we were a lot poorer then than we are now, you know. And I was, I was the son of a widow, and it was just extraordinary. And then to come there in the wake of the wonderful free cinema of the of the, the late fifties, early sixties, with Albert Finney, Alan Bates, Tom Courtney, you know, it, it was just you know Rita Tushingham and Vanette, the young Vanessa. It was an extraordinary time, and nobody was being judged. You were always encouraged to cross the barrier. But we are so feudal in this country that we revert back to that. We revert back to people being in their place. And sadly, that's affected the poorer element of the country. Now, I don't, I'm not going to dish Eddie Redmayne or Benedict Cumberbatch for, for their schooling. That's the what that happened. They, they were schooled. And actually, there was the money that was put into those schools. And so the Eaton has a fantastic theater, apparently. And so does Harrow. I don't know. I haven't seen them. I, not acquainted with that. But at the same time, you go, well, that's happened. But there is a whole lack. There's a whole lack of part of society which has been ignored. And it's very hard for a young, for a Brian Cox of today to make that journey. It was much easier in the 60s than it is now. We have to make sure that it's available for all, not just for a, 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 a certain section of society. Brian Cox, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you, Anne. Thanks for watching. You can listen to the full interview on our podcast, The Economist Asks. Click the link to find the episode and don't forget to subscribe.